Okay, so that is Tigris and Euphrates. That may seem like a ton of rules, and it is a ton of rules. But if you back up and look at the big picture, there's really only 10 things you need to remember to play this game. I'm going to call this the 4-3-2-1 method of remembering how to play Tigris and Euphrates. Copyright Ryan Sturm, 2009. Okay, there are four things you can do on your turn. Lay a tile, lay or move a leader, lay a catastrophe, and swap your tiles. There are three ways to score points. By laying tiles in kingdoms, by having a leader in a kingdom next to the colored monument at the end of the turn, or by winning conflicts. There are two ways to have a conflict. You start a revolution within the kingdom by dropping your leader in and having a religious conflict with red tiles despite the color. And the winner always scores a red point. Or start a war between two different kingdoms by connecting them. In this case, they fight on whatever color they are. They get to use the tiles on their side of the battle and play tiles from their screen. The loser's things blow up and the winner scores points. And finally, the one object of this game is to score the most points the most evenly. The person with the most cubes in their weakest color will win the game. That's it. That's all you gotta know. So how am I know what I'm supposed to be doing? Well, that's what the hamster is for. Part 3. The Hamster. How do you win this game? Okay, so now this is where I tell you how to win this game. Here's where I have to be honest and tell you, I'm not really that good at this game. <laughs> this game has a very steep learning curve to get good at it, which I think is one of the reasons to learn it. I would say at playing this game 10 to 20 times, I'm a relative newbie to the strategy of this game. And maybe we can get some advice from some more experienced players. But I've probably played this game more than you, so let me tell you some basic strategy to get started and what I've seen from people who are successful in this game. From my experience, the person who wins this game is the person who does these two things the best. You get your leaders solidly positioned next to monuments early in the game, and you set up a good defensible position so it's hard for someone to just jump in and take that spot or to steal the monument from you in, at a war. Or you win some major wars either by attacking people and stealing the, these really great spots or by having these spots very well defended, anticipating an attack and being ready and when someone attacks you they utterly fail and in the process score you a bunch of points by doing that. So how do you do those things? Um, well, you want to get a monument up quick, you want to defend yourself with adjacent temples, you want to play tiles of the same color to prevent a war. You need to get monument points from two or three leaders. Then get points from the other colors by trying to steal board position through a revolt or setting yourself up for a successful war. All the while protecting your current position and using your catastrophes cleverly. And don't forget to keep an eye out for jumping your leaders into those juicy spots when they become available. Now, how do you do all that when you just get two measly actions on your turn? Well, that is what is so beautiful about this game. You probably want to do three or four things on your turn, but you can only do just two. So you have to choose carefully. Now, the last piece of advice I will give you is don't just go jumping into a war. Before you connect kingdoms, please look at the full implications of connecting them. You may get so focused on winning the black versus black war that you forget there's a blue and a green connected there too that are going to have to fight each other. And you may forget that that person may have been storing up tiles to beat you. You really need to think about what are your chances of winning this war and what are the, all the possible results. Because winning and losing large wars can make you or break you in this game. I think this game can really be compared to chess for many reasons. The possible moves are easy to explain, but the strategy is incredibly deep. This game really rewards players who have played this game a great number of times. 
you have to play it enough to see how wars and revolutions play out a little bit and you have to see how and why someone wins the game of course the analogy to chess falls flat on a couple major levels though uh, first this is a much more tactical game there's no way you can plan out ten five four three sometimes even two moves in in advance it's, it's just impossible because that the board changes so much many times before it's your turn again and second of course there's a lot of randomness and hidden information in the game due to your drawing of tiles and at some points, you just have to make educated guesses of what tiles a person has, and unless you have a uh, super memory, what kind of points the other players are going for. And both of these reasons are reasons why I'd much rather play this game than chess. It's a wonderful game, and a game that I'm looking forward to exploring a lot more in the near future. I hope you enjoy exploring it as well. Part 4, Footnotes. So, the footnotes. In this game, this game has a lot of little, tiny, obscure rules that are easy to miss. And so I've taken all those little, tiny, obscure rules and I have put them in this section that I'm going to call the vegetables because they didn't quite fit with the meat. Because these rules are sort of generally more appropriate just to point out during the play of the first game. Now this collection of vegetables is, you know, eight very obscure rules that are kind of hard to find in the rule book, but they are quite important. So uh, if you are the one running this game, make sure you're familiar with these eight things. The first obscure thing to know about the rules of Tigris and Euphrates, first of all, the trader. Limes for sale. He collects treasures. Now when you collect treasures, there's those conflicts that happen. And I didn't get it to talk to. If a conflict is going to happen and there's two treasures on the board, you have to do the conflict first because tiles could blow up and you don't get the treasures till after the conflict. So if tiles blow up and the treasures aren't connected anymore, well then you're just out of luck. The other strange rule about collecting the treasures is look at the four treasures that are furthest to the corners on the board there is a small rule that says if you have the choice to take one of those corners or another treasure you must take the one from the corner the second most obscure thing to know about the rules of Tigris and Euphrates is another rule that comes up occasionally is you can't connect two kingdoms with a leader piece and this would be because sometimes that might start a war and that's just not allowed. So you can't take your blue farmer, connect two kingdoms, and then say there's a black king over there and a black king over there and we have a war and there's a leader in the middle. That is illegal. Now remember, a kingdom has to contain a leader. So if you have a kingdom and just a group of empty tiles, you are allowed to play a leader piece in between the kingdom and those tiles since that's not going to cause any problems. The third obscure thing to know about Tigris and Euphrates is is that it's possible to score points for other people. Remember I said you can lay a tile anywhere you want. If I play black tile for some reason in another player's kingdom and they have their king there or you know any of the respective leader I, they, I scored them a point so they're gonna score a point for that so just be aware of that. The number four obscure important thing to know about Tigris and Euphrates is when you connect two kingdoms with a tile, you never get to score a point for that tile. Um, remember it gets covered with that handshake, and so that's one of the reasons why you don't get a point. The other thing is that it's covered because that tile does not count towards the war. You look at either side of that tile. So let's say you're about getting ready to fight a black war and you want to connect uh, the two kingdoms to start that war. You would probably wouldn't want to connect with the black tile. Maybe you'd want to connect with the green tile. And that way you can save the black tile in your hand to play during the war because that green tile is going to get covered with a handshake, will not score you a point, and it will not count in the war. 
The fifth obscure thing to remember about Tigris and Euphrates is that remember, as an action, you can lay a leader from off the board to put on the board, or you can move a leader from the board into another position on the board. Many forget this or get confused, thinking that maybe they have to take the leader off the board and then spend another action to put it on the board. But no, that's not true. You can always pick up a leader from a spot on the board and place it on any other legal square on the board as one of your actions. The sixth obscure thing to know about Tigris and Euphrates is if you're in a conflict and you have an, an you know, you're crushing the other person. Let's say they they only have two, and you have you have two extra temples that you could play, and you don't want those temples anymore. You can play as many or as few tiles in your hand. You're under no obligation to pay the exact amount to win, or even to pay an amount to win. The seventh obscure thing to know about Tigris and Euphrates is when we have a red war. That is, there's a, a red priest over here and a red priest over there, and they get connected, and then they say, Praise the great god Ketchup! And there's a big Ketchup war. So they have their war, they count the temples on one side and the temples on the other, they p play their temples, and then remember, the pieces blow up in a war. Now temples don't quite blow up as good, and here's why. If a temple is supposed to blow up, and it has either a treasure on it, or it's connected to a leader, it's connected to any leader and it's going to blow up, it doesn't blow up in that case. So sometimes when you have a red war, uh, less tiles get blown up for those reasons, because a lot of times they're connected to other leaders. The eighth obscure thing to know about Tigris and Euphrates, I just learned this a few days ago, the tile distribution is not even. I always guess I just assumed it was, other than maybe those ten starting temples, but that's not true at all. There are a few extra red temples, um, and the red temples are the most prevalent in the bag. If we look, there are 57 temples, so if you take the ten out that start the game, there are 47 in the bag, and then there are 36 farms, so there's a few more of those blue farm pieces, which is why they always seem to be in the way. And then after that, there are 30 black and 30 green. So if you're wondering why you have a few more red or a few more blue, that's the reason why. And having those reds is, of course, important because of um, the possibilities of revolutions and just for getting those leaders on the board. Oh, phew. Uh, if you hear my voice starting to get hoarse, uh, it's because I've been recording for about an hour and a half. There's just a, a lot of information to get in on this game, and you just really want to talk precisely when you're when you're teaching this game because there's a lot of uh, difficult vocabulary and subtle differences between the pieces. <laughs> Well, that's going to about do it for today's episode. I want to remind you to join and participate in the guild, check out our teaching guides, stop by and rate the show on iTunes, and consider making a PayPal donation. And I once again want to say a big thank you to Randall Rasmussen for creating the video portion of this episode. But for now, I'll say so long. And until next time, I hope you will learn, teach, and play great games. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Ryan Sturm for the How to Play Podcast.